The Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, Preaxer Zemium Fungicide, and Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans. Kelvin Hepner for Real Agriculture, and uh, we're at Manitoba's Crop Diagnostics School, joined by John Givlosky, entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture. And John, it looks like grasshoppers should once again be on our radar again this year. Yes, uh, we've had three or four dry years in a row, which really got the population built up. And uh, a lot of people were optimistic that maybe with all the rain we've had this year, we wouldn't have as many grasshoppers. But that's not necessarily what we're seeing. Um, a lot, when it comes to rain and grasshoppers, a lot depends on the timing. And as a general rule, excess moisture in April and May won't do a lot except for maybe uh, delaying the development a little bit. But as far as killing grasshoppers, grasshopper eggs can sit underwater for days and not get killed. A, a colleague of mine once took some grasshopper eggs and put them in a glass of water for a week. And then he poured the glass of water out and the eggs hatched. Okay. So, rains in April and May when there's still eggs aren't going to do much. When they're vulnerable to heavy rains is in uh, June. Once they hatch from those eggs, they, they don't have any fat reserves and they have to feed right away. And if they're delayed in that feeding, that could kill them. And they, they're also more vulnerable to disease. So timing is really critical as to how rain might affect them. Okay. There's also this natural fungus, right, that uh, that also will eliminate or reduce grasshopper populations. What do we need in terms of conditions to be conducive for that in terms of controlling them? Humid conditions are what we need. So uh, it's a fungus that gets into the grasshoppers. It changes their behavior. Um, what they will do is end up climbing to the top of the plants and dying clinging to the top of the plants. So if you see a lot of dead grasshoppers at the top of your plants, a fungal pathogen has gotten in there. And this altered behavior benefits the fungus because eventually fungal spores will build up in the grasshopper's body. That cuticle will split and being high in the canopy, those spores can then just move around and infect more grasshoppers. Uh, that fungus does better under humid conditions. So years where we do get a lot of rain and it's damp, it's humid, so hot, humid conditions, uh, that will help spread that fungus. Okay. Do we need those conditions over, like, does that impact the population within uh, one rain event, or is that a, a, a more of a year-to-year year -year type impact on grasshopper populations? It is more long-term. Uh, I mean, the grasshoppers that are hatching out they're here and they will be dying in their later life stages. So they've already done some feeding and will be killed. But that will help us down the road. It'll mean less reproducing grasshoppers going into next year. And it will reduce feeding somewhat in this year. Okay. So when it comes to the basics of scouting for grasshoppers, can you remind us what we're looking for and the, the staging at which we should be looking at taking control if we have to? So right now we're in early July. Uh, we don't have adults here yet, at least in Carmen, where I'm uh, doing a lot of my looking. It's mainly uh, later stage juveniles, anywhere from early to late stage. So th this is an ideal time to be starting to look for grasshoppers. Uh, actually, we suggest people June and early July are great times to be looking. Um, again, there's still juveniles. And if you detect a really heavy population now, they're much easier to control when they're juveniles than when they're adults. Okay. So this is the LD time to be looking, but you're not looking for adults that are flying and have fully developed wings. You're looking for juveniles with maybe partially developed wings at this point. Okay. And when it comes to the actual types of grasshoppers, we have many different kinds in, in Western Canada. There's only a few that are the actual pest species. Yeah, so um, nationwide we've got about 180 species, and in Manitoba we've got about 85 types of grasshoppers, so lots of different types. There's actually four that we consider to be pests here in Manitoba. Um, three of them are generalists that feed on lots of crops, and there's one called the clear wing grasshopper that is a grass specialist. And uh, just to uh, give you a bit of uh, details, uh, clear wing grasshopper, badly named, it's actually got black dots on the wings. Uh, it is our grass specialist, so uh, it will only feed on things like cereals, forage grasses, pastures, uh, pasture grasses. 
it will occasionally move into broadleaf crops, but it doesn't really feed much there. Now, two-striped grasshopper, that is our dominant species this year. Adults have two big white lines that go down their back. Uh, so, a fairly big grasshopper, so easier to detect. The juveniles, what we're seeing now, have a couple black lines on their thorax and a big black band on their hind leg. So that's what we're scouting and seeing right now. Uh, that is right now our dominant species in most of Manitoba with a bit of clear winged mixed in. Some migratories as well. Our fourth pest species is called Packard. It's not nearly as common. Uh, it's more of a dry land species. We saw a bit in the northwest last year, but um, yeah, not as common. And those are our four pest species. Okay. Finally, John, can you take us through that decision to spray, when we should spray, and then also the different approaches, some of the strategies that we can maybe employ to uh, to minimize the amount of chemical that we have to use, but also uh, have effective control? Yeah, so, um, Again, right now, we're encouraging people to scout your fields and, and your field edges. Um, and there has been both full field and edge spraying going on in Manitoba currently. Uh, as far as decision making goes, the tricky part is uh, a lot of our thresholds are based on estimates of uh, grasshopper counts. Counting grasshoppers is not easy because you're walking towards them, they're jumping away from you and you can't really accurately count them, but you can estimate what numbers are like. So the important thing is don't get too caught up in knowing that you were exactly 11 or 12 or 13. Uh, do things in ranges if you have to. Was it 5 to 10 or 10 to 15, 15 to 20? Uh, estimate what levels are like. The thresholds in a lot of crops are around that 8 to 12 per meter square range, but again, you're estimating anyway. The idea is just to get out and know what that population is like, and also look at what are they doing, how much feeding are they doing. Uh, as mentioned, clear wing grasshopper, it can be at big numbers in a broadleaf crop and not be doing anything. It's just in transit. It's not going to feed on that crop. Um, so look at what the numbers are like and how much feeding are they doing. Now as far as control strategies go, there's different techniques and strategies a person can use. As far as insecticides, we have brand baits and we have foliar sprays. The brand baits, um, they do have a fairly decent residual to them. They can be used. They're more of a popular choice for doing field edges and um, uh, possibly things like uh, pasture lands. Um, foliar sprays, there's several options, there's, and they vary in their pricing and the amount of residual to them. Uh, what some people will do is pick a product with a bit longer residual and actually spray it in strips. And they've done research on this in pasture lands where they found that by spraying every second pass, so you spray a pass, leave a pass, spray a pass, leave a pass, you can get uh, fairly good control just doing that because grasshoppers do move around and uh, you can get 80% plus control by just spraying every second pass. Um, now a product with a bit more residual is likely going to work better than a product with less residual if you're using that technique. Yeah. But it takes some of those products that are maybe a bit more costly and it reduces the, the cost for the farmer. Well, thanks for your, there's much we can learn and much much to talk about when it comes to grasshoppers, John, but uh, thanks for sharing your expertise with us. Okay, thank you.